Hi there. How are things? Things are going pretty well for me. I hope things are going well for you as well. And today I want to talk with you about two theorists and the topic of this section, structures of racial and gender inequality. Uh, we're going to talk about William Julius Wilson and Janet Shavitz. And we've already considered racial and gender inequality in earlier slides and discussions and in your textbook. Uh, you might recall W.E.B. Du Bois discussed these things, uh, and also uh, uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman discussed these. Uh, I should mention W.E.B. Du Bois was focused on racial inequality. Uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman focused on gender inequality. Now those theorists came decades earlier than the two theorists we're going to discuss here. Uh, all the four theorists are American which is one thing they have in common. But the explanations that you're going to see here today uh, are very much rooted in structural explanations, the, the large structure of society and how that causes different um, possibilities of advancement and equality for different racial and uh, gender groups. William Julius Wilson got his PhD from Washington State University and he became faculty at the University of Chicago by 1972 and became faculty at Harvard, one of the most prestigious universities in the world, by 1996. He's also received a few very impressive awards. He was named one of Time Magazine's 25 Most Influential People in 1996 and in 1998 won the National Medal of Science. There are several key ideas I'm going to talk about under his theory and it's worthwhile to just discuss these generally right now so that we can get to more specifics in a minute. Most people know racism. Racism is the idea that one race is seen as uh, better than or more valuable than another. Um, racism for Wilson is something which he saw as having larger effects in the past uh, and he's arguing in some ways for the declining significance of race in terms of affecting opportunity and we'll talk about that more. Exploitation. In this chapter they talk a little bit about Marx's idea of exploitation and that is when workers are working to add value to a product but they're not paid in accordance with the actual value that they add to the product. They're paid less than what the product sells for. So this is exploitation for Marx. Split labor market, you can define this as two collectives of laborers, okay, because it's a split labor market, and each one is willing to work for a different amount of money. Jim Crow refers to two things. It refers to uh, minstrel shows and the stereotypes of blacks that were uh, promoted from minstrel shows and laws that were used uh, against uh, African Americans that segregated African Americans after um, the uh, Civil War ended. The post-industrial economy we're going to talk about is a shift from manufacturing jobs to knowledge-based jobs uh, and sometimes service sector type jobs. The truly disadvantaged is Wilson's term for African Americans who are left behind in inner cities in the United States because upper class and middle class blacks have moved to the suburbs because they were economically able to leave those traditionally black neighborhoods and also whites left for the suburbs because of what your textbook calls white flight. Things we'll talk about in a bit. Wilson does a really nice job in talking about what he sees as three phases of race relations in the United States. Historical periods. And each of these has its own unique uh, relationship between blacks and whites related to the economy and social structure. The plantation economy 
is a reference to plantations which are farms in the south that used slaves, slave labor. So for things like picking cotton and other agricultural products, slaves were used as virtually free uh, labor sources to uh, get those goods. And there's a discussion in Kenneth Allen's book about uh, exploitation as the idea of being able to take advantage of a worker and pay the worker less than the product that the worker is producing or adding value to. In this case, you have a virtually free labor force and so high level of exploitation going on in the plantation economy. In this economy, race is the key factor for that kind of exploitation without limit that's happening to African Americans. Chattel slavery is a term that's used in the text and what it means is, is that uh, blacks become commodities. Uh, African Americans as slaves were bought and sold, uh, were given uh, minimal um, supplies to maintain uh, their basic standard of living and not a lot else and so this caused a certain type of relationship the thing was is that whites were working in the working class but you could really think of it as only a, um, a two-class system there's the aristocracy and those working class whites and then blacks which are not really a class they're slaves they're held as property so there isn't much class conflict at the time because the whites and there's just aristocracies that basically rule things and then those who are working and there's no antagonism really. Wilson then says that there's a, a shift after the Civil War and into what are called New Deal politics. The Civil War was fought over blacks right to freedom and in fact the Emancipation Proclamation by Abraham Lincoln was what said that uh, blacks in the South will be free. And so this, after the war was concluded, was the law of the land. Slavery no longer was tolerated. At the same time as that, right following that change, uh, industrialization started to really ramp up, really take off. And especially in the South, industrialization started to become very prominent. What happened then is that you've got this new group of people, uh, African Americans, blacks who are on the labor market and competing against whites for work, for wages. And so uh, whites suddenly realize a threat by this new presence of laborers. They want to control the labor market that they once held to themselves. So what happens is William Julius Wilson argues that there's a rise in the stereotyping of blacks through things like minstrel shows where uh, you see the image of uh, Jim Crow uh, blacks being promoted in those shows and very vicious, pernicious stereotypes. Um, blacks as um, untrustworthy, um, very happy-go-lucky, less intelligent, um, dangerous, uncivilized. Some of these things are promoted heavily in this period because uh, whites want to keep blacks in their place, as it were, and that is also corresponding with Jim Crow laws, laws that promoted segregation. And these are uh, things like you would see uh, different kinds of facilities for blacks and whites, drinking fountains in public spaces, restroom facilities, spaces in theaters, but also to uh, educational opportunities. The decision of Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal, was a Supreme Court decision which said that separate but equal educational facilities are okay. In fact, you know, we know that that meant really that some schools were uh, far less uh, quality than others. What happened though in this period is that uh, as whites were trying to form unions and uh, protect the rights of workers, they would sometimes refuse to work at a place and uh, go on strike. 
And then what would happen in the split labor idea, split labor market, is blacks are willing to do that work and so they became strike breakers. They became the group of people who would break the picket line and work for the lower wages that the whites were trying to fight for as a group. This caused strong racial tensions that Wilson points out. And finally, when the depression occurs in the 30s, the stock market crashes, there's a realization among black and white workers of a collective interest and so they're working together and it's uh, much less tension and, and problem uh, because they see their mutually shared interests. So, as I said a second ago, Wilson uses the idea of a split labor market to explain that second phase of race relations I just mentioned. So after slavery, as I just said, um, races were competing for work and that caused a split in the labor market. Uh, blacks essentially were willing to work for less money than were whites in for these working class type positions. Um, and white workers wanted to protect their interests. So what did they do? They promoted stereotypes of blacks, like I said, uh, through these Jim Crow images and tried to prevent blacks from attaining skills and education through, for example, um, laws like Plessy versus Ferguson, a Supreme Court law, or a Supreme Court decision, I should say, that promoted uh, separate uh, but equal schools, which in fact were not equal at all. The third phase that Wilson discusses is World War II until present times. He argues that at this period you start to see government bans on discrimination, so that helps to promote racial equality and opportunity to get jobs. With this, uh, blacks begin to move to urban centers that have industrial jobs. Uh, so, for example, uh, industrial centers like Detroit and Los Angeles also to many areas of what now is called the Rust Belt. So Cleveland, um, Cincinnati, um, Pittsburgh are, are big cities where uh, they had very, very strong industrial base and large African-American populations. Then there was a shift in our economy. Starting in the 1970s, our economy moves away from manufacturing-based jobs toward more knowledge-based jobs and service sector jobs. In the 1970s, American uh, industry realizes that they can outsource those types of jobs, that type of work, to even cheaper labor markets outside of the United States in places like, for example, Asia. And this means that there becomes a, a higher rate of black unemployment in these urban areas. The cities themselves, like for example uh, Detroit, fall into uh, disrepair as auto manufacturing is outsourced to other places. Um, you start to see Detroit not even being able to pay uh, for its own uh, services inside the city, which is why uh, it's in such terrible conditions today. If you want to see this, uh, you can go on YouTube and look at um, videos about the city of Detroit uh, showing huge swatches of neighborhoods where no one's living and people burn the houses just for fun uh, amazingly enough it's, it's shocking anyway Wilson describes also though how changes in the United States in the 1960s allowed for uh, blacks to take advantage of affirmative action programs if they are already moving toward middle and upper class positions in other words, if they are well-educated and have good skills. Affirmative action means that jobs, or employers, I should say, take an affirmative action toward hiring minority group members. So you've probably seen affirmative action type statements, equal opportunity statements, in advertising. So a job might have at the end of its advertisement, uh, so-and-so employer is an equal opportunity employer, we do not discriminate, uh, we encourage applications from minority groups. 
So those blacks, according to Wilson, who were already skilled and educated and able to take advantage of affirmative action programs, did. And then what happened was they were able to move and leave the neighborhoods, which were primarily African American in the 1940s and 50s in U.S. urban areas, they were able to leave and go to suburban type environments. And Wilson in particular studies Chicago in his book, The Truly Disadvantaged, where he looks at graphs and charts and is able to show this uh, not only black exodus from these black neighborhoods, uh, but also white flight, uh, the term that um, he uses in the text. And so this leaves behind what Wilson calls the truly disadvantaged. And that is poor blacks who don't have the skills and education to take advantage of affirmative action programs. The idea of the truly disadvantaged allows Wilson to discuss the policy implications of his work. And he finds, in general, that racism is not gone. It still exists, but the significance of race is declining. What he points out as more important, really, is the issue of class, and that now there need to be, for example, uh, universal standards like universal preschool, meaning that preschool needs to be available to everyone, everywhere. Uh, there needs to be some type of universal uh, standard for child support. Uh, right now each state has its own standards. Uh, sometimes they are enforced more so than others. Um, this is going to be a, a problem and it'll perpetuate poverty if it is not addressed. And we are also one of the very few industrial countries that has a relatively weak parental leave program. Uh, industrial countries like, for example, in Scandinavia, uh, Denmark and Sweden have very strong parental leave programs so that uh, they have support while they're raising children. Children are not raised in poverty. Um, so Wilson believes, in summary, we need to link together families, schools, and work uh, in order to make for a solid working class uh, and not threatened by basic things like, for example, having children, uh, causing them to fall further into poverty. Also, he thinks we need national standards for schools. Right now, we have school funding largely based on property taxes. So you might have a very different kind of school district in one neighborhood and then in another. Uh, one school district might have a lot of money for its students and uh, to pay its teachers and for the buildings and resources in a school, which means that to some extent you have de facto uh, segregation, de facto problems. And these are things that Wilson thinks could be addressed if we have national standards all schools have to meet. Janet Shavitz is our second theorist, uh, and there are the dates in which she lived. She received her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, a very strong program. Uh, her book, Gender Equity, uh, won the American Educational Studies Association's Critics' Choice Award, and it was also selected by Choice Magazine as an outstanding academic book uh, for 1990 to 1991. Uh, her life was cut short. She died of cancer after a long struggle with that at the age of 64. Let's uh, discuss a little bit of context for Chavitz's theory. One idea is the glass ceiling. In general terms, this means um, a place where women rise up to within an organization, and they can watch men keep rising up in terms of status and money, uh, pay, but they themselves can't break through it. They're stuck. That's the glass ceiling in simple terms. And as evidence of it, 
women make approximately 76% of what a man makes for the same job within uh, the same workplace and also with about the same education. So Chavitz is interested in explaining why is this that women are prevented from making more money uh, and prevented from advancement in their careers. Chavitz wants to talk about the different ways that gender inequality is promoted and is reproduced. And to do that, she wants to look at three different levels or structures, I guess I could say. And this is something that um, I'll unpack for a second. Okay, There are larger structural factors in the world which are you can think of as macro level. So these are big structural factors, uh, like for example, oh, um, systems of patriarchy and capitalism. Okay, there are what are called mezzo-level structures. Mezzo-level means group. Okay, so you've got larger social structure, then you've got group dynamics, and then the third level she considers are micro-level, which are really uh, very very small face-to-face -face kinds of encounters where socialization occurs the individual level. So let's go through these. The macro level coercive structures that Chavitz talks about are things like patriarchy and patriarchy affects women's opportunities according to Chavitz because it promotes a system where women's labor is considered cheap or even free. What does that mean? In real terms the biggest example of this is domestic labor. Women often work what Arlie Hochschild called the second shift. They'll work a job and then they'll come home for their second shift unpaid domestic labor. Child care, uh, taking care of the home through cooking, cleaning, um, these kinds of domestic chores. All right. and Patriarchy is the system that allows this to be reproduced. Men go out and work and earn money, and traditionally women stay at home. Uh, this is the traditional system that Chavez observes. So what happens then is capitalism and men's dominance is strengthened through this kind of arrangement. Because men are working, men are holding those paid positions, women are not so they have less power and less money. For Chavez, the solution to this is that women need greater workforce participation in higher paid positions. The second level of coercive structures that women encounter, and by the way I, I should mention coercive means that you don't have any choice. It forces you, okay? So very, very powerful uh, forces. Cantor, uh, Rosebeth Cantor, is a theorist that um, Chavitz draws from, and Cantor does social psychological uh, type work. So she's looking at uh, the effect of small groups on individuals and how those uh, affect us. So structural positions uh, are influencing psychological states and behaviors. What does this mean? The possibility for advancement. When women look at the work world around them, they see that, for example, they are not represented in many instances. So, as an example, um, you can see some jobs, men being more present in uh, boss position, manager positions. Uh, and then an example of this is that sometimes women who are hired are placed on what's called the mommy track. The mommy track means women are seen as, usually in their adult years, potentially wanting to have a family. And so therefore, men in positions are hesitant to give them managerial positions because if you have your choice between training a man versus training a woman for a managerial position 
and the woman might leave or need extensive time off to raise a family, then it's likely that the man will be given the opportunity for advancement as a manager. Because why would you invest that money in a woman who might leave? That's the logic. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying that's the logic of the mommy track. Um, women's positions then in such situations are seen as having less power so women don't have the ability to achieve goals and then there's also a discussion of uh, relative number uh, tokenism so this is um, an example of it says here uh, Wilson or I'm sorry uh, Kenneth Allen notes that um, if you were to walk into an organization as a white person perhaps and you see that all the positions of powers are held by black men uh, whites hold all the menial jobs how would you gauge your chances for advance advancement in such a firm so this is the idea that um, if there are very few people in those positions you're not seeing evidence of your ability to hold those positions The final level that she considers, uh, micro level, and again, as I mentioned before, more kind of individualistic based, you know, face to face encounters and inner psychic structures that promote gender inequality. There's a discussion Alan has about exchanges, uh, exchange theory and social exchanges. And you know, the general idea here is that people tend to gravitate toward equal exchanges. Okay, uh, There's this idea of uh, reciprocity. Um, what happens is, though, is that you can ask whether or not these are really somewhat equal exchanges within, for example, the domestic sphere. Uh, one issue that Alan raises here is that men do more occasional work rather than repetitive work within the domestic sphere. So, for example, men take out the trash, uh, men fix things, women are more uh, doing the repetitive chores, laundry, cleaning, etc., uh, child care, okay? And there's a discussion then that um, you can add to uh, this, which is that uh, because of these unequal exchanges in work, women are coming into their intimate relationships, usually with men, uh, having unequal status, power, and class position. So because of the unequal uh, imbalance, for example, in the domestic sphere, women might work less and have had less opportunity to rise up, gain prestige in occupations. So women are often coming into their intimate relationships with men at a disadvantage with less status and power. Also, Shavitz points out, and this is a very important idea, that what often sustains systems of gender inequality are patterns of volunteerism. That means that people choose to take on certain roles and, and statuses. And so, as an example, you can say, well, women, in, in some instances, might choose the domestic sphere. Women might want to be mothers, uh, might enjoy uh, the domestic uh, arena. And to that extent, sometimes that maintains gender inequality. So the way it's phrased by Alan, both men and women continue to freely make choices and display behaviors that are stereotypically gendered. So these things sometimes are taken on by people voluntarily. There's also discussion of Nancy Chodorow's work and girls versus boys intra-psychic structure being different. So let's explain that for a second. Girls play differently than do boys. If you think about, for example, uh, the work of Barry Thorne, he uh, wrote a book, uh, Gendered Play, and it's the idea of what do boys tend to do in play versus girls. Uh, boys tend to play in groups, 
girls tend to have more intimate play, one-on-one -on -one type play. Uh, boys want to violate rules, and when they do, they diffuse the blame. Girls, when they play, often get blamed uh, for it, their violations and punished more frequently than boys do. Um, there is also the idea of what kinds of play they do. Boys tend to play competitively with each other. Girls in their interpersonal or very small group play, they want to do supportive type work. There's an instrumental orientation for boys trying to achieve goals. Girls, it's more expressive play. Uh, if girls, for example, play at house or dolls, they don't play to win at house or dolls. Boys do tend to try to dominate each other or figure out who's better at certain skills. These types of inner psychic structures affect the types of orientations that boys have toward the world and girls have toward the world. They're undeniable in terms of their effects, and that's what Schotero points out. So it corresponds well with uh, gendered social learning. Uh, Albert Bandura's work is cited here that um, social learning occurs through stages like attention, retention, motor reproduction, and motivation. Um, so children negatively or positively reinforce behaviors in small groups. That leads to a discussion of how gender is performed. Uh, you could say, and they'd say in your text, gendered impression management. Uh, this draws from Irving Goffman and the idea that people try to manage the impressions that they give off. So gender is a category, one of the first categories we try to figure out whether or not people are male or female. I often think that we have three things that we very quickly try to make sense of with people. What's their race, what's their age, and what's their sex. For most people, they want to very clearly display this through impression management. So that's uh, what Goffman talked about. How do people display their maleness or femaleness? Uh, also, too, the idea of gender as part of self-validation. Um, the idea that it says um, women are, to some extent, uh, encouraged to be seen as women, and some of the characteristics which can be um, hard on women or hurting women. Uh, it says, entails demonstrations of weakness, vulnerability, and ineptitude. So Shabbat says these are things that can um, be seen as ways women connect with femininity, which hurt women. Lastly, Shabbat looks at the processes that can generate unintentional changes in gender inequality and intentional changes in gender inequality. She goes through four different things that can be the unintentional source of change that may make for more even gender equality. Uh, one of them is population change. And this is something like the number of jobs that are available versus the size of the working population. So, for example, if there are more jobs available as the size of the working population declines, then that means more women will be able to fill those jobs. Okay. Sex ratio changes is another possible source of unintentional gender equity. If there are more uh, men than women in a society, actually, I screwed that up on the slide. Uh, let's fix that. I meant to say, if there are more women than men in a society, then women are better able to access better paying jobs and prestigious jobs. So please change your notes on this. I, I made a mistake. If there are more women than men in a society, they'll be better able to access prestigious jobs. The third and fourth processes that can cause gender equity are economic and technological changes. Now when you think about it, for example, when we change from manufacturing type jobs to service sector or information type employment, like William Julius Wilson talked about, that means that 
um, men are not lifting heavy objects, which are kind of preconditions for work in a manufacturing situation. Um, women are going to be better able to gain employment when technology reduces, for example, the need for strength as a precondition for employment or mobility as a precondition for employment and also time requirements because if women are able to work uh, around family schedules for example they'll be able to have better types of jobs. Lastly, Shabitz considers processes that cause intentional change in gender inequality. Okay? And there are a couple issues here which she points out. Women among all the different possible ways of social categorization have what are called cross-cutting interests. So women uh, come from all different kinds of classes, neighborhoods, racial categories. So there might be the interests of those uh, that can sometimes supersede the interests of women coming together as a group. So for example, black women may say, my interests are different than those of white women. So Shabbat says that women have to overcome these cross-cutting interests in order to fight for gender equality. And that is going to increasingly be possible through urbanization and industrialization. Those forces tend to bring women together in cities, and they also allow for technological interaction, right? Electronic mediated interaction. And that will give women the possibility to mobilize as a group. Because as Shavitz argued, women are going to best be served and receive gender equality when they are able to get high-paying, better jobs.